Celebrities of any age or culture experience pressure to be seen to be compassionate. We see this today as celebrities spend much money and time investing in places where their attention can hopefully do some good. This effort can often actually do good, but that impulse is alloyed with a desire to be caught on camera doing good. Sometimes, perhaps, the desire to be caught in the act of doing good ends up swamping any good actually being done, or at least ends up siphoning off resources that could have done more good had the team of journalists and paparazzi not been brought along for the show. But it was ever thus. Pontius Pilate famously had a compassionate tradition once a year at Passover to release a favored prisoner who deserved the ultimate sanction, hoping by this act to purchase peace during a time of potential uprising. Roman emperors famously distributed bread and circuses to sate the appetites of the lower class in Rome, helping to entrench their power. It is probably not your typical way of seeing Jesus, but he was, in his day, a bit of a celebrity. His fame quickly spread, sadly more because of his miraculous works than his timelessly wise words. He was both authoritative and yet approachable, famously so, and he did heal people who came to him seeking it. It's commonplace to know Jesus' compassion as a consummate servant, but I want to examine a couple of stories from Mark's Gospel that illustrate the depth and wisdom of his servanthood. Sure, he healed people, but his healing touch went far beyond the surface, but deep to the core. Jesus famously said, if you want to be great, you must be a servant. But Jesus did not explicitly teach about being a servant before he had already consistently modeled that servanthood. Mark captures the moments between Jesus' sermons and teachings, which he often only glancingly references, and frustratingly so. In the cases we see in these passages below, Jesus didn't plan to heal these two people. They presented themselves to Jesus indeed as interruptions in what Jesus was already doing. Yet we see Jesus' genuine compassion and servanthood present in both cases. As I read, consider what the two stories have in common and their differences. I'll be reading from Mark 1, verses 40 through 44. A leper came to him, begging him. And kneeling, he said to him, If you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And then again from Mark chapter 5, verses 24 through 34. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians, and had spent all she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now, what did you notice about the people who approached Jesus? What would you say characterizes his response to each? Did anything surprise you? Both of the characters in these two stories were richly unclean and would therefore be unwelcome in the crowd that followed Jesus. Moreover, with Jesus as an acknowledged rabbi, the people would have assumed that it was even presumptuous for them to approach him. The barrier to approach was more severe for the woman, who of course hoped to avoid face-to-face -face encounter that followed. Still, even the leper approached Jesus without any confidence that Jesus would wish to do anything for him. Interestingly, both people believe that Jesus has power to heal them. Both wonder if Jesus would wish to do so. We are often like these characters. My guess is that you believe, as I do, that God can and does heal. Yet we so often come to Jesus believing in his power, but doubting his compassion, at least for us, at least for now. Our theology says that Jesus is powerful, but we wonder if he would work to answer our specific prayer right now today. So we can identify with the humble, uncertain approach of the leper. If you choose, you can make me well. The leper could not have imagined the response he received from Jesus. The best he could have likely hoped for is, uh, uh, okay, uh, be healed. Now move along. But Jesus does more than the leper asks. He reaches across the gap to place his hand on the leper's arm or shoulder. I do choose. Be healed. Jesus didn't need to touch the leper in order to heal him. His words alone carried the healing power. 
The touch was an extra gift to a man who likely had not experienced human touch since he first was recognized as a leper. Mark tells us that Jesus did this because he was moved with pity, while others around him were likely moved with disgust. Typically, people wouldn't touch a leper because of the fear of contagion, as leprosy was incurable. To touch a leper was to be considered ritually unclean at least, and would take seven days to wait in quarantine before the unclean label would be lifted, very much like recent COVID protocols around avoiding infection. But surprisingly, Jesus goes on past the healing to speak sternly to the leper, requiring him to go to the priest and be inspected and perform a sacrifice according to the law of Moses to prove to the people that the former leper is now no longer unclean. Jesus did this, it seems, not to generate more publicity for himself, actually he didn't seek that, but so that the leper could rejoin society and the worshiping community in the synagogue. So while the leper came to Jesus asking for physical healing and would have been excited to leave with his request granted, Jesus saw the leper as a whole person and addressed needs beneath the surface. Physical need, Jesus healed him. Emotional need, Jesus touched him with compassion. The social need, Jesus sent him to the priest for an inspection so that he could re-enter society no longer unclean. And spiritual need, Jesus sent him to offer the sacrifice that puts him right with God so he can re-enter the worshiping community of the synagogue. Of course, we are unsurprised that Jesus would heal the leper, partly because we've read this story before. Still, it is a little surprising that he sees this man not just as a person with a disease, but he sees the various unseen implications of that disease that he addresses as well. And we see this higher level awareness at work when he stops to heal the woman with the flow of blood. The woman in Mark 5 is, like the leper, unclean. But unlike the leper, she does not go to Jesus to ask for healing. Her illness, the flow of blood, is hidden. While the leper literally wears his illness on his sleeve, the woman remains incognito. The woman has an extraordinary amount of faith. She has decided that she only needs to touch Jesus' cloak and then she will be healed. No one else in the crowd was getting healing that day. Jesus noticed her healing because it was unique. But think about what it felt like to be her. She believed Jesus had power, but did not trust that Jesus would freely bestow it on her. What do we call it when someone wants to take something from someone without asking? We call that theft. The woman planned to pocket a little healing from Jesus, hoping he wouldn't notice and be none the wiser. She'd melt back into the crowd, healed and happy, and return home relieved. But oh no, Jesus did notice. And like a man in a crowded market realizing his wallet is missing, he cries out and scans the crowd, looking for the culprit. Who touched me? Now, of course, even the disciples wonder, how can you even ask that? Lots of people are touching you. But only the woman knows what Jesus knows. And while she might have been able to elude the crowd's notice, Jesus' gaze or her own conscience causes her to step forward and acknowledge her infraction and, as Mark says, to tell the whole story. Imagine the courage it took for the woman to step out of the crowd and confess what she did. She has imperiled the rabbi, whom she acknowledges touching with her unclean hands, but also everyone else in the crowd whom she may have accidentally have touched, and presumably the rest of the crowd by the electricity-like nature of ritual uncleanness. She had sullied the rabbi in the crowd and then stolen the rabbi's power. She knew herself to be guilty, but had no idea what her punishment would be. But she stepped forward and confessed, telling the whole 12-year-long story. In response, Jesus gives her four gifts for stepping out of the crowd and confessing when he says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. First of all, the physical need. Jesus had already healed her when she touched him, but now he is freely giving her that healing rather than her walking away with guilt that it was perhaps improperly taken. Secondly, emotional need. Jesus calls her daughter, which he did not need to do. In this way, he affirms her, one who has felt outside of society and alienated as a member of his family. As a, a father of a daughter myself, I know the power of this title, which I would bestow only on one similarly treasured. He also sends her away in peace, though she came in fear and trembling. Thirdly, social need. Jesus had already healed her, but he served as the priest did for the leper in pronouncing her healed for the benefit of the crowd. Be healed of your disease. Finally, spiritual need. Jesus announces to her and to all who hear him, your faith has made you well. Far from being unworthy and rejected, her faith has been accepted as shown by the healing she's received. As a result, she is once again welcome in the worshiping community as a daughter of Abraham. So once again, a person in need came to Jesus for healing, but Jesus gave her more than she came for, more than she could have expected. 
Jesus truly saw this woman, not simply as an unclean woman or an interruption to his busy agenda or as an opportunity to advance his own PR goals. He saw her illness and the complex needs produced in her, the emotional, social, and spiritual implications. Jesus addressed those deeper issues as well. In both cases, Jesus asked people to do something uncomfortable, to go to the priest or to step out of the crowd. For both of them, this request was an act of compassion and a pathway to more profound healing than they had already received. I think this is typical of healing work of God. It is often a deep work and a merciful gift, but it involves an uncomfortable step of faith that takes courage. Jesus is quite a servant and a leader in these encounters. So what can we learn from him? What are the characteristics of a servant as seen in these stories? Indeed, I can see many aspects like compassion, care, wisdom, and power, but I'd like to identify three characteristics that I believe Jesus illustrates that are required if we're going to be servants and leaders. First of all, sensitivity, the ability to see beyond our own needs, beyond others' apparent needs, beyond the presenting problem, beyond what is needed to what will be needed. Most in the crowd saw the leper and his need for physical healing. Jesus saw the whole person. He's not a leper, as if that's his identity. He now has leprosy, and that has caused a complex of, of issues in this man's life. Jesus saw beneath the surface to see the, the needs that he could address with this leper. Jesus had hard challenges for the leper and for the woman. But if they obeyed, they pointed the way beyond to a transformed life. If our focus is on our own needs, our own reputation, our own safety, or our own schedule and agenda, then we will rarely be able to lift up our eyes to see the needs of others around us. And when people do show up as the interruptions in our lives that they so often are, we also need to learn how to see needs beneath the surface and further in time than what is visible right in front of us. This is often the problem with celebrity servanthood which often focuses on superficial aid or interventions, but rarely takes time to address root causes and deeper concerns. Jesus' approach with the woman or the leper would not as readily yield to a photo essay documenting his power. Secondly, willingness, the desire to act. This can be a heart of compassion from the heart, or a reflex to be generous from the gut, or a choice to make it a priority from the head. For some people, willingness will spring from a heart of compassion, while for others, it will be more of a head decision. For some, it will not come as a choice at all, but a reflex, a gut reaction to pull out the wallet, to say yes to a request for funds, or to give to a person in need. We may have different sources for our willingness. We don't all need to be as heartfelt, rational, or reflexive as our spouses or friends, but we need to find somewhere within us the readiness to serve when we see needs that we can meet. Thirdly, ability, the resources to give. Time, Availability, money, things, skills, education, training, healing, God's power, insight and wisdom, love, care, compassion. We all have some resources, and we're not asked to serve beyond the resources God has entrusted to us. But we all have time and many of these other resources, and behind us, a God that is glad to entrust his resources to us as we put them to use in his name for the sake of those in need. If you're a person who wishes to be a servant but never sees needs until it is too late, you probably need to grow in sensitivity. People will eventually stop asking you to serve. If you see plenty of needs, but have always a reason why you aren't available to serve right now, then probably you need to find a way to make your willingness more of a priority. As you grow in your ability to, to see and your desire to act, God will entrust you with more skill, resources, and time to make your servanthood real and to make more of a difference in the lives of people around you. As we see in Jesus' model and his teaching, there is great blessing in servanthood as we serve in faith. We do look to God for reward, as indeed Jesus himself did and certainly taught. But as Jesus says in another context, if we serve only to be seen and possibly photographed by others, then we have already received our reward and have therefore forfeited a more durable and valuable blessing. Let us strive for the character to seek our reward from the one whose opinion, at the end of the day, is the only one that matters. Please don't forget to like and subscribe.